Paul McGregor, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Oh, howdy. Hello. How nice to be here with you. Let's get into it. Um, maybe start by introducing yourself to, to my, my audience slash vidience. <laughs> yeah, nice. Good on you. I love that you're doing it by video. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. I, I'll take us back to what I studied at university because that feels like a nice starting point. I studied law. Uh, because uh, the week before I was going to start university, um, I'd enrolled in an English degree and I was in working part-time in a kitchen. And this particular kitchen was the Air New Zealand engineer's kitchen and it was hustling and bustling. And the chef, he hated his job, basically, and <laughs> he'd studied English. And he said to me, Paul... Whatever you do, don't study English. It's a waste of time. You'll end up as a chef like me. So I was very impressionable and quickly changed my degree to law. And I loved studying it, but I've never practiced as a lawyer. So I've done all sorts of other things. I've worked in government. I've managed an adult education center and most recently been a partner in a community engagement firm. So that's been my kind of journey in terms of work. And as it, people can probably tell from my accent, I am born and raised in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's a tiny so how, do, how do you say, how do you say, the, how do you say the, the uh, indigenous name? Aotearoa. Aotearoa. Okay, I've, I've read not it bad, a lot. Not bad, Howie. Yeah. I've never heard it pronounced. I've read it. Aotearoa. Yeah. And it's All a, right. And Thank it you. comes from... The story when uh, Māori were travelling to New Zealand and uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was um, one of the female leaders. She saw this long white cloud and she shouted out, ow, ow, te ao, te ao, te ao roa, which means the land of the long white cloud. And so that's where the name comes from because it is, it's just a long, thin country with lots of mountains in the middle. Ah, oh, nice. I have not. I have not been, but it's def, it's definitely on my bucket list. Uh, it's on everybody's bucket list, really. Yeah, yeah. Ever, <laughs> ever ever since Peter Jackson, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has a lot to answer for that man. <laughs> all good, all good things. Yeah. See, I'm just, um, yeah, just. I wonder how you guys walk into your houses with all those round doors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh my god. So I, I don't know what we, we, I want to talk to you about you know the, your work and what you've learned from it because you're taking you're taking your experiences out uh, more yeah. broadly into into organizations um, and so one of the things I was looking at I was looking at your your podcast back catalog and you talk a yeah. lot about community about inclusion about engagement and and I'm list, I'm watching this from a U.S. based lens even though I'm now in Europe I'm. You know, I lived in the U.S. since I was 58. And, the, you know, there is there's something about, I think, New Zealand in particular that really is inclusive of Maori indigeneity, of, of the people who, you know, who named the land, who were there before the settlers came over from Europe. It, it seems like much more of a of a living presence than, than let's say, than let's is at least in consciousness than let's say you know the Na Native American presence in the United yeah. States, which is which is often which mostly is ignored, but when it's when it's um, recognized, it's recognized through these sort of meaningless land declarations before we do the meeting, <laughs> in which right, we talk right. about you know stripping some more you know uh, coal out of the ground. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting to hear your impression of what it looks like from outside New Zealand, you know, there's a spectrum, right? And every day, sometimes we're at one end of the spectrum and we're at the other end of the spectrum, depending on who you're talking to, what's going on. Um, so I'm probably a little unusual in that I can speak some te reo Māori, which is the Māori language, um, you know, probably at an intermediate kind of level. You know, I grew up in a place called Christchurch, which was white, conservative, uh, farmer, basically a large farming settlement that had um, kind of 
just blossomed on the plain. So it's the third largest city in New Zealand and still a very small one by international standards. Um, but in Christchurch, you know, I didn't l- learn a single word really of Māori language and didn't know much about the culture. It wasn't until I got to university and had Māori friends and became part of the Māori Law Society uh, that it started to become more real for me. Mm. Like I remember listening to the news and you know, they would interview someone who would speak in English and then there'd be Māori words that they would use. And I remember thinking as a 15 or 16 year old, you know, what are they doing speaking this language? Like no one understands this language. Why would they speak it? <laughs> because it just wasn't part of my life. So while it might look um, in certain ways from the outside, it's very different on the inside. And right now, a lot of uh, Māori culture is under attack in a lot of different ways, as it always has been in this country. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to ask a question. I, th- I hope it's not entirely self-indulgent, and I hope that, that yeah. other people will find it interesting and that you'll have something to say, but if not, we'll, we'll just drop it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm now learning Spanish on a kind of a daily right. basis, and I'm, I'm very sensitized to kind of negative transfer, like things that that are in, that don't make sense to me as an English thinker. Like I have to, I can't say I like something. I have to say it pleases me. I can't say I'm interested in it. I have to say it interests me. So, and I'm wondering, as you learn Maori, did you like? Did you notice that there were ways in which you had to think differently or perceive the world mm-hmm. differently mm-hmm. in order to understand and express? Yeah, I mean, language is the key to a door to another culture, isn't it? And what I've learned from Māori is to take a more collective perspective of the world. You know, Western culture is, if we kind of make it um, to the extremes, Western culture can be quite individualistic. Māori culture is very collective. So their smallest unit is not the individual, it's the family, (laughs) whānau. And that worldview just permeates through everything so for me that's probably been the biggest lesson is is when you learn about another culture deeply you learn to question your own culture and the things Mm. that you thought were just common sense that everybody believes and thinks you realize they're not common sense they're just what you've been conditioned to believe so I definitely hear what you're saying there about um you know, relearning things that you had previously thought were just the way it is. Yeah. So if the smallest unit is the family, can you, can you say things like, you know, I, I'm hungry, I hurt my uh, hand? Yeah, yeah you, you definitely can. Um, I think that's more of like a philo- philosophical way of um, thinking about the world. So uh-huh. maybe I haven't taken enough notice of the specifics of language as you have, Howie, but it's more I've learned from Māori different philosophies and ways of thinking. Hmm. Have, have they, and I know that, you know, you know, people who like us who like, you know, I, I have a degree in public health. And so I was sort of oriented towards look for poor people and help them. <laughs> Right, which 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 in one sense is lovely, in another sense it's horrible, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. because the assumption is that I'm on a pedestal, and you know I was I was doing work with with um, with, with poor black communities in Philadelphia. I went to Temple University, and that's who we had access to, who you know who didn't have the power to say no to our desire to help, mm-hmm. and and yet with you know. Um, with this other language where you become the beginner and you're learning from them, like I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what, um, what gifts have gone the other way? What gifts have gone from but, me to them? From, 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 from them, them? From, 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 that have accrued to you from exposure yeah. to, to, to a group that is, is continually marginalized and, and sort yeah. of on the outskirts yeah. of economic power. Like what, yeah. you know, what, I mean, what, I, I what have you learned? So what have you much. learned from, from oh, them? So, so much, so much. Um, the connection to land is a huge thing that I've learned from spending time with Māori. So um, one of the first things they teach you in uh, Māori language classes is what's called a mihi mihi or a pepeha. And that 
introduces yourself by speaking about where you've come from. So the question that you ask yourself is ko why o and why is the Māori word for river and o is me and ko is a, um, kind of like a, is the verb. So you're asking yourself from which waters do I flow? Oh wow! And so when you come onto uh, Marae, which is a Māori uh, meeting house, they have this call and response where um, the the Māori whose marae it is will, you know, call out to their rivers, to their mountains, to their ancestors, to their connection to the place. And then the manuhiri, the guests, will do the same. They will call. And there's this lovely call and response where you're trying to understand where are you from? And, you know, who are your ancestors? So the mountain is the embodiment of, the, uh, of an ancestor. So it's just, that's one huge thing I've taken is, um, the land is a very spiritual connection for Māori. And so from that flow all sorts of different ideas and beliefs about how we should live with the land. Hmm. So I, I imagine Im- embedded in that is a, um, a real suspicion of someone who claims to be self-made. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a Māori proverb about uh, kumara. And I don't know, have you ever eaten kumara, Howie? I don't know what it is. I no, no, okay. So. Well, we, we, we have to get here to New Zealand. We had some kumara chips with dinner tonight, and the kids just love them. Um, so it's a sweet potato. And okay. uh, there's a Māori saying which basically says, the kumara does not speak of how sweet it is. So Māori, uh, are very, it's a very humble saying in a way, right? Uh-huh. And this can be both a strength and a weakness for somebody because... In today's world, sometimes you need to speak of how sweet you are. You need to um, share your successes and your knowledge and your ideas with the world. Um, but there's this saying, which is actually, hold up. Like, hmm. Just keep, keep yourself under wraps a little bit and keep, keep a, a chip off your shoulder in a way. Right. So I think that's a great segue into an invitation for you to speak about how sweet you are. So, <laughs> oh, um, oh, no. what, what do you, what do you do in 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 the world? Like, what matters to you um, in, in the world, I'm, and what are you moment, trying to bring? My more? my my big obsession at the moment is about questions, Howie. And so, you and I have got that in common, right? Um, you know, I've observed a lot working with leaders in their teams that when we show up with answers, and when we cut our curiosity off at the knees, it really stalls progress because the world is changing so fast around us that when, as soon as we think we know something and we blind ourselves to the possibilities that something else could be possible, um, we kind of, it's like we turn our senses off and we can no longer understand what's happening in the world around us. So... My big passion at the moment is helping leaders to ask more questions and ask better questions. Mm. So I don't recall ever learning how to ask a question. Yeah. How how do we, I mean, maybe, like, no, not like maybe, maybe at a sort of advanced, you know, it it was, as I'm thinking about, as I'm talking, I'm like, okay, kind of like when I was, you know, being prepared to, to do a PhD, they want you to focus on something interesting, but it's more like, but, you know, and, and so to run a good experiment really is a question, but it was never framed that way. And yeah. just in terms of everyday life, like how, how does, how does somebody learn what a good question is? Yeah, we, we don't get taught. Uh, well, some professions may be more than others. I mean, uh, you know, I studied law, and so we learn in law how to ask questions that trap people, not <laughs> questions that uh, open people up. That's a very different skill. Um, that's asking a question to prove a point rather than to get uh, novel information out of people. So, yeah, I certainly never really learned. Um, you know, some professions might, psychologists, for instance. And... Yeah, I think that's a huge gap. So this 
when we're in school, we're very much conditioned that our value comes from finding the answers. The answers are at the back of the book, just turn back there and there they are. And you get graded on your answers. I've got a five-year-old daughter who's recently started school and already, you know, three or four months in, she's being graded, she's being assessed, she's being shuffled into this stream for that and this stream for that. Um, so very early on, you learn as a young person that uh, it's good to have the answer and it's bad to not have the answer. And yeah, we never really get taught. What is a good question? What words do you use? Um, when do you ask different questions? If you ask this, what happens? And so for me, that's just become a real fascination. Uh-huh. So how, how, do you, how did you begin to learn that? I think by being exposed to situations that felt completely different to my upbringing and, and to the education I had, and then scratching my head and going, well, what on earth happened there? A big one for me, I was working at the Ministry of Justice, my first sort of major job out of university, and I was, was not enjoying it. We had very poor engagement scores. I think 80% of us were disengaged from work and the turnover rates were really high. Um, and so I was looking around at what else could light me up and signed up for a youth systems leadership program. We drove to this retreat center north of Wellington, the capital city. And I remember being in the car with some random person who I'd been paired up with to drive out there. And we were both sort of going, what, what have we signed up for? What is this thing? Yeah. It's a three month long leadership development program, basically starting with this five day long retreat. And we get into this beautiful retreat center, you know, birds kind of chirping and there's the river running behind it and it's lovely. And there's this warm welcome. And soon we're sitting in this large circle of people. There's about 30 of us from all around the country, different ages, different colors, different backgrounds. The leaders of this uh, event you know, open, open things up nicely and then pass to the first person to introduce themselves. And we're all going to go around and introduce themselves. And the first person speaks for probably 15 to 20 minutes. And I remember sitting there going, oh, my God, you know, what, what the hell am I going to say? And I am nowhere near as amazing as him. He was probably one of the older people there um, in his 50s, I would have say, at the time. And he'd founded a media company and had done some pretty amazing stuff. So... Fast forward sort of to the end of that five days and having started this thing going, going, what on earth have I signed up for? By the end, I was going, how the hell did they do that? Because mm. I had never felt so connected to another group of people before. And I've gone on to start social enterprises and businesses with some of those people. Some of them are clients. I'm probably still in regular touch with 15 of those 30 people. Sometimes, you know, more than I am with family members or with school friends, right? So there was something going on there that just really intrigued me and I didn't understand what it was. And, you know, for somebody to ask what was a pretty small question, can you please introduce yourself and to get the kind of response that they did, I just... I was so interested in what was different between that and the kind of meetings that I was having at the time in the Ministry of Justice where it was, hi, I'm Tim and I work in accounts. Mm. Just two very different worlds that I couldn't mm. reconcile at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what, I, what I heard is that the, the, the first thing that you did before you could begin to ask a good question was to embrace not knowing to, to mm -hmm. like almost like a, a wound like oh i my i you know we have to feel like we're competent enough to understand the world to you know brush our teeth and get in the car and buy food and mm -hmm. and, and all of a sudden something happens and there's a, there's a, an invitation to say i am not i don't know <laughs> what's happening and it's yeah. and it's you know, and it has to be okay somehow. It has to be sort of psychologically safe inside your own skin to say, I don't know what's going on and that's okay. Mm. 
those are pretty critical moments, aren't they? Which path do you go down? And I reckon we have those moments so many times every day of, ooh, a gulp, I don't know what to do. Do I accept that or do I deny it? And I don't know about you, but sometimes it feels easier to deny it. Like that's that's the easier path. We kind of put a whole lot of um, models, mental models in front of us to help us feel safe in the world. And we need yeah. those. Yeah. And <laughs> we also have to lean into those situations where we don't know and to be more curious. But yeah, it's not yeah. easy. So, yeah, and I... And I certainly can feel the tension and I feel, you know, like mm. being in the I don't know space feels, I don't want to say vulnerable because it's, it's but it, but sort of something like. Well, why, like why don't you want to say vulnerable? Well, because I, I, I don't want to um, give people the message that it's actually dangerous, but right. it feels it feels exposed. Right. Like if, if I'm you know, I've, I've stopped doing this, like I would talk in groups about like someone sharing and like how, how courageous you are and how vulnerable. And I realized what I was doing was telling everybody else that this is actually scary. Like yeah. the thing I want them to do is scary. So, I, you know, I think list, linguistically I'm getting away from that. Mm. Um, but just feeling ex like if I feel like I'm going to be attacked or if I feel like the world around me is unsafe psychologically, I'm much less likely to flip into that open, not knowing intrigue that, that you talked about. So I'm, yeah. so I'm wondering, you know, is part of your work when you work with leaders and with organizations to create the container in which not knowing is okay? Yeah, because you can't be in that space if you're in a culture or an organization where that's not okay. And a lot of us aren't. Uh, a lot of us would feel that the thought of saying, I don't know, makes, you know, you know, we go, oh, people will think I'm stupid if I ask a question. Uh, they'll think I don't know my job, that I haven't done the research, or they'll think I'm attacking them if I ask a question because mm. um, I'm turning it around back on them. So, yeah, there's all, all sorts of um, little barriers that, uh, that we create in our mind, and some of them are legitimate, yes. Because you mm -hmm. might be in a culture where actually you will get um, you know, some, some backlash from a question that you ask. And some of those beliefs are not legitimate. They're ones that we are putting in place to keep ourselves safe, but which may do more harm in the long run. So, so when you work with a leader to create um, an organization, you know, let's, let's start with them. Like, how do you help them ask questions if, you know, if their leadership depends on them being seen as the smartest person, the person whose hand is steady on the rudder, and all of a sudden it was like, well, if she doesn't know, then we're yeah. fucked. Like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think one of the misconceptions that comes up, right, is when you're leading with a question, it doesn't mean you only ask questions. You don't walk into the room and go, I don't know anything, and... Uh, here's my question to you. Like that's, uh, it's more, you give some direction, uh, which is, as you, you've used the phrase, creating a container, and then you ask a question within that. And that framing piece first is really important because otherwise your question can feel like an attack when it has no context. Mm. So we need a bit of both, don't we? We need the direction, the yeah, tell me where we're going and why we you think where we're going there, and ask a question within that framework too. Mm. Do you have an example, maybe from from a cl client work or your life, just to kind of turn this from abstract? Yeah, yeah. Into... Um, I was catching up with a friend recently. I'll bring us back to the Māori culture we were talking about earlier, um, in. Oh, it was in and around the COVID lockdowns. Um, there was some funding given locally where, here where I live for a regional strategy development process, right? Which basically is trying to ask, how can we be more successful uh, and healthy and happy as a region? 
And it was led by uh, a Māori organisation called Wakatu Incorporated, so a Māori business. The, so the worldview they brought into that conversation was very different. There was um, one of the earliest meetings for that where there were council officials, there was the mayors, um, you know, government agency officials and all of that, and they were in a room trying to understand, okay, how can we make our region better? And so the conversation was at the level of, um, well, should we build this road next or should we build this road or should we do some public transport? And it was very much kind of thinking, what do we do in the next three or four years? The One of the facilitators uh, who kind of stood up and, and said, hold up, hold up we need to raise our gaze. We need to change the kind of conversation we're having. And so the question she put uh, was, how can we be better ancestors? Hmm. And how can we look 500 years into the future rather than five years into the future? And that just, like, most people in the room were kind of stunned and flawed because that was such a foreign question for them and such a different way of thinking about vision and strategy and change. So for me, that's an example of where um, your worldview can come through in a powerful question and it completely changes the frame around an issue where people have been looking at it quite small down here and suddenly you expand the frame to there or you might uh, shift the frame from here over to there. And as you can hear when I was talking, there was a little bit of direction, right? Like explanation of why I'm asking this question. And then there was just the question itself and they mm. both needed each other. And, and at the, in the end of the day, it's, you're still going to do something. You're still going to build a road or build a bus line <laughs> yeah, or something yeah. like that. But what, like, how did that change the 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 process and the tenor and you know the yeah. the relationships i don't know what what yeah. what shifted with that question it shifted the conversation from problems to possibilities mm. from how can we fix what's broken to how can we imagine what could be possible so kind of from that point on what i observed as mainly a participant in the process, but sometimes a facilitator, what I observed was, yeah, the quality of conversations that people were having were very different. And yeah, the relationships that people had changed as well. This, this must have been pre-COVID actually, because yeah, a lot of those relationships were then the key relationships during COVID times where people knew more about each other, knew more about where they came from, what made them tick, because they had some of those deeper conversations and that made it easier to respond in, in the thick of that crisis. Hmm. So, um, I mean, that's such a beautiful question about, you know, 500 years, how to be a better ancestor. So when I, when I coach people, what part of my model is, you know, well, to respect them, I want to hear what their struggles are, what their problems are, like what's up yeah. for them, what's, what's brought them yeah. to this conversation. And the as soon as I feel like they they feel heard and understood, I want to shift to what they want. So from problem to possibility, as you said. But my I feel like my question is very uh, blunt in the in terms of like not not inspiring or subtle enough. And 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 so like I I would typically ask so like you know what's the outcome you're going for here, and. Right. Yes, it's a possibility question, but I often get like it takes a long time to get them from like, I just want the bad thing to stop or I want this person to stop doing that or I just want to make our numbers. And, and the kind of the kind of um, level of, of thinking that you described in this meeting before that question, what do you have? Do you have advice for me on what, you know, questions to ask specific words specific questions or or ways of thinking that can help people break out of it the way the the 500 year question did yeah well as i was listening what popped into my head was that you've anchored them by asking about the problems in that level of thinking 
Mm. So you may might need a circuit breaker so you can then anchor them in a different level of thinking. Uh, that, wow, that was quite a lot of jargon in that sentence. So how can I explain that a different way? Um, mm. I mean, this is something actually that I've learned from sales training, right? Where if I mention the number 1 million to you, and then four minutes later, I say, oh, my service will be $100,000. You go, oh, okay. Uh, it seems reasonable. But if mm. I mention that, you know, if we're talking about $5, and then all of a sudden I say, oh, and my service is worth $100,000, you go, what the? <laughs> That's outrageous. Mm. So kind of the same thing uh, uh, is what I am was hearing in that conversation. You've been anchored in very small uh, issues right now and so that just makes it really hard to then shift up to big possibility thinking so let me put mm. a question back to you Howie what could you do in the middle to create a different to, to break that circuit break that first anchor and create a new one mm. so first thing that comes to me is some sort of um, energetic shift Right. That could that, that that I would probably ask to do in a, in a bodily sense. Like, great. Let's yeah. breathe in, and as you as you exhale, let go of any of any tension you notice in your body related to that issue. Mm. Even like, and I've and, and honest to God, I've never thought of that. I've been I've been coaching for twenty five years. That's that's the first time that has come up as a tool that I could use for that purpose. So thank you. <laughs> that's awesome, and I've never thought of it either, Howie. So you know, there's the power of your question, which has opened something up in me that I didn't know was in me, and I was able to bring that out because you thought to ask it. Oh, we are. Uh... Oh, we're we're being, getting kind of meta there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah. So there's there's so there's been a, 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 um, a sort of neurological circuit breaker, somatic. Um, and then what and, would I do? I'll, I'll add on to that actually, Howie, because the brain science shows that something different happens when you get answered a question. Your brain lights up a whole lot more. So if I give you an instruction. Um, what's an instruction um how we tidy your room <laughs> this feels like quite a common instruction in my life at the moment kids um right your brain judges that and doesn't light up but if i ask mm -hmm. you a question about that your brain suddenly um different things happen different parts of your brain light up it goes into solution finding mode um so, gosh, what would I ask you to try and make you clean your room, Howie? Um, not what would it take for you to clean your room, because then that becomes like a, a an argument. Yeah. Then, um, what would be a, what would be a way to to clean your room that would be really fun? Yeah, nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. put on music, get a couple of nice uh, yeah, containers. Yeah. yeah. And they're away. The little kids are away. Yeah. And the, the tidy ups playlist goes on. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So I think I think almost like what comes to me next would be something like I am I'm so ex like I want to like give them excitement, right? Because they're they're mm. coming. They're they, they're mired in their problems. We've just done breathe. I am so excited for the work we're going to do together. Mm. Um. And I'm, I'm looking forward to when you look back on this problem and say, I am so glad that this happened mm. because of what it led to. Mm. And like, can we, let's talk about what, you know, what's possible. Yeah. What could be possible for you here? Yeah. That's a lovely question. Um, yeah. But it's still, it's still not the same as the 500, like uh, like well, I, I would, I wouldn't, I don't know. I'd ask someone like, "What could be? What you know? What could we do here that would have a positive impact of you know five hundred years from now?" <laughs> yeah, I mean that that may be too far out, right, for a coaching conversation. But you could do a smaller equivalent. So imagine it's five years from now, Howie. What would you mm. like to be different because of this conversation? Oh, 
That's damn obvious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, apart from world domination, I don't know. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I guess just the the um, changing the time frame mm. uh, of of a uh, you know sort of like telescoping the lens of the uh, of an issue can create a different perspective. Just looking farther into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Right. What else you got? What other <laughs> what other <laughs> tricks up your sleeve? I have no idea how many. I can't even remember what the original context for this question was. What was going on? Um, well, I asked about how to shift, you know, like the power of questions and like, how, how do you know what questions to ask? Mm, mm. I, yeah, I don't think you do until the moment that you're in them. Like one of the mistakes I made in the early days of running a podcast was I'd write down this list of questions to ask and <laughs> you can hear it when somebody is running a podcast and they're running through their list of questions. Oh, so my first question is blah, and my second question is blah, and you can feel it as a guest because you'll talk, and they just, you're like, I just said something interesting. Why are you not responding to that? Yeah. <laughs> just move the topic on. So you know, I think as we get better at questions, we get better at worrying less about the words, worrying less about the perfect question, and worrying more about just staying curious. And I think of this a little bit like, like a cell phone. So you know, a cell phone needs battery and it needs a SIM card in it to have network. And you've got to have those on all the time. Mm. Otherwise, you can't do anything with your phone. And so that's curiosity for me. It's always got to be on. And you know, when that goes for me, that's... Uh, that's that's my first signal is that I might be burning out or I might be working too damn hard or trying to do too mm. much because I stop yeah. being interested in why things are happening. Yeah. And so or, once or you've done that, then, then the questions matter less, right? Your curiosity uh -huh. just comes yeah. through and other people feel that. Yeah, or yeah, or I was gonna say, or that you're working on something that doesn't matter very much. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's hard. Um and and can be the reality for a lot of people in organizations where you're you're doing busy work. Yeah. You're, you're attending 20 hours of meetings a week and, you know, you're working on a project that uh, doesn't light you up. Um, it's, it's certainly not unheard of, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So when, when you work with... Um, do you work with teams as well as individual leaders? On, yeah, on yeah. Um, I mean, with teams, a lot of my work is facilitation training. So that's uh -huh. how do I show up and be that person at the front of the room that is guiding a conversation and um, shepherding people through a process. Um, mm. So that's one way that I work with teams. And then the other is to be the facilitator, you know, because sometimes you need somebody external to come in and ask not dumb mm. questions, but innocent questions. Mm. Um, I read an article by Dr. Jason Fox recently who um, does some amazing work on um, play and creativity and how to gamify your work. And he talks about weaponized naivety, which is this <laughs> idea that when you're an external working with an organization, you can use your not knowing as a weapon, as a helpful weapon. Mm. Because when you ask the question that everybody else has been too afraid to ask, um, you can unlock something that um, yeah, has just been sitting there waiting to be let out. Uh huh. I want to just do a quick shout out to Jason Fox. I've just started reading, like two days ago, I started reading his book, uh, How to Lead a Quest. <laughs> nice. And so I'm, I'm going to put a link to, to his to his two to two books that I know about because um, yeah, I think yeah. he's, he's very um, good. He writes a fantastic sort of monthly or six weekly newsletter, which I always make time for because he's got a very unique style of writing and pulls from lots of different places as well. Excellent, excellent. I love what, yeah, weaponized naivete. I was just brainstorming with a friend of mine um, a workshop that I'm 
I'm planning to run with right. with groups around um, creating psychological safety, which yeah. is kind of a uh, an under a fundamental underpinning for the work that you do. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that my friend suggested was a kind of a paradoxical exercise where you, right. you put up the problem and you ask everyone to brainstorm 10 ways to make it worse. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Um, I learned that from uh, there's a wonderful little card deck called Facilitator Cards created by a friend of mine, Meg Bul Bulger. And that's one of her questions is uh, one of the activities is it? is the opposites activity and <sighs> it works every time people love that howie because we're always pressured to make things better and to be the best version of ourselves at work and so it's just really nice to be the worst version of yourself and think how things will go wrong <laughs> um, like one of my favorite connection questions um, is what's one dull or un uninteresting fact about yourself and <laughs> i guarantee you when you ask that you'll get really interesting answers um and if you ask what's one interesting fact about you you get really boring <coughs> stuff yeah <laughs> bless, bless right enough. then people then people are trying to curate yeah yeah they'll go uh i mean, I mean I came up with that one after attending an antenatal class and we all got asked, you know, to share one interesting fact about you. And I think my wife, we just built a tiny house at that time. And so my wife said, oh, we've just built a tiny house. And I, so I'm going, oh, well, there's nothing else interesting about me. And I said, we have a dog, like boring. Yeah. Um, and everybody else kind of went, um, you know, I'm an accountant. And, I, and then as soon as somebody listed their job, then everybody just went around and said what their job was. Uh, uh, but if you ask what's one dull fact, you get some amazing stuff. <laughs> there, there is, there's like a, a universal principle at, mm. at, at play there. I think it's, it feels like it's, it's related to what you said about the brain lighting up with questions that, mm. you know, the, like facilitation, like what's the difference between facilitation and leading? I feel, I feel like there's something, there's something about how, how to play with the, you know, how to instead, you know, when you pull, people will pull back. Like we have a natural sort of resistance. Like, I'm not sure where I'm going. So I'll just, I'll just leave the question. Like <laughs> I love facilitation question. Yeah. versus leading. What, what are the yeah. differences? I mean, I, I've been exploring that myself for the last year or so. And it depends is probably the answer because there's so many different ideas and definitions of what leadership is. Um, facilitation, the word comes from facilis, which is a Latin word, which means ease or easy. So for me, it's about bringing a sense of ease to hard things. And yeah, that can look like actually being someone out the front of the room who's giving clear direction about what to do next. Mm. Well, is that leadership? Yes. So th there's this very murky crossover between the two. Um, and I think different skill sets uh, and ways of thinking have developed around each. So you know, facilitation is more invitational in general. It's, it's about asking. And leadership uh -huh. often is more about telling and let's go this way let's do this this is the vision mm -hmm. so i think they work really nicely together and there's this sort of murky middle ground in between them yeah uh-huh so when when would when would a leader know that the, now is the time for facilitation yeah. what are what are the symptoms of a facilitation invitation yeah i mean we could go back to the oh i don't know so when the leader like clearly does not have the answer. So for me, right, it's one of the skills of, in, of anybody in leadership is to continually be looking outward at context, what's going on in the environment around me. And that's your, that's your signal then. Uh, am I in an environment where we have many potential options, where there's lots and lots of stuff going on, where things are changing every day, then actually that's the environment, that's a signal to go, you've got to ask more questions because 
this is when you need your people around you to be able to give themselves to to this as fully as they can and when we lead with answers then it kind of shuts down the conversation it turns people's genius just down a little notch because you're saying that actually I'm the genius I'm the one with the answers but when we ask the question then it turns other people's genius up to 11 it allows them to bring themselves and all the little bits of all these different people to bear to the problem or the situation that you're in so for me it's it's context is your answer to should I ask or should I answer and mm. There's no, there's no clear bright line, but something in your belly will, will be letting you know. And that for me is the art of facilitation is to listen to your belly, listen to your gut that's telling you to ask the question. Yeah. Well, I'm hearing again, the cu curiosity and presence. Yeah. I'd like to, 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 to be aware of yourself in relation to the other people and, and the, the larger context. Yeah. Which yeah. I still find really hard. Like I can know that in theory, but in practice, when you're stressed, mm. when you're in conflict, it's still really difficult. So I'm curious for you, Howie, when, like, what do you do to stay connected to yourself when you're in a tricky situation? Oh, here, here, here you are asking the questions on my podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm <laughs> Good, curious, trick. Just like you. Good trick. Good <laughs> trick. Um, so sometimes I freak out and I yeah. am completely useless or worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, one one thing is uh, um, to do to kind of recognize what my own triggers are. And, 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 and to explore, you know, in my own time, what I'm scared of, right? Because shut, shutting down is, is it's for me, always about some kind of protection, defensiveness, which means that my, my body mind thinks there's something I need to be protected from, mm. right? If I'm, feeling, if I'm feeling safe, it could be, you know, we could be in a real pickle. But if I feel safe in my environment with the people around me, I can be open and helpful. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of it has just been sort of personal work on my own time. Mm. Um, just getting, just getting to know, just mapping out, yeah. you know, the things that I'm scared, you know, and, and, and like one, one of the big things I work on is sort of with, with people is, is updating their maps. So I right. think about it like, um, you know, if your, your car's GPS system, um, you know, it's connected to the internet and you hear from, you know, Google or Waze tells you, oh, there's been an accident at this intersection, avoid it. Google or Waze won't make the mistake of assuming that that accident is always going on. Yeah, right. But, but our brains often do. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so. You know, I learned in my new my in my family of origin that I, in order to get my needs met, I had to be louder than everyone else. And now th that accident is permanently on my map. And so when I walk into my the, my workplace, people are going to have a problem with me. <laughs> and right, so, so, so I think a lot when you've got that on your map, is the work for you? to then take it off your map or is the work for you to accept that it's there and to figure out a way around it? Um, I think both are good strategies. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, th you know, in, in the short term, very often we just have to counteract and say, okay, yeah. my, everything in my being says this is dangerous, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to, I'm going to hold my tongue. I'm going to ask people what they need. I'm going to get feedback and advice from people. But it's still it's still an act of management, and so it's it's mm. it's using energy that doesn't need to be used. And we do know how, in most cases, for people who are open and willing, how to how to remove that accident pin. Mm. And so then it becomes an issue. It doesn't become an issue of I have to continually manage myself. Mm. And and the reason I like that better for there's a bunch of reasons. One is it's much more efficient. It's permanent. It's effort. It's eff free of effort. The other mm. thing I think is related to what you were saying about presence is that 
if if I'm managing myself around the accident that doesn't exist, I'm divided. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something about being unified that I think helps. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that uh, metaphor, Howie. That's a really useful one. And so. if I look back at all the situations where things have gone really pear-shaped for me when I've been in leadership, it always has come back to me ignoring some yeah, fear signal that's come up in my body. And I've tried to, I, I haven't found a route around it. And I haven't even acknowledged that it's there. Um, so we're coming up at the end, the end of our the hour that I, I promised you this would t only take. Um, for folks who are listening and are like, I could use more questioning in my organization, in my in my leadership. Like I could see, like how, who do you work with? How do folks find you? Yeah, sure. Just find me at paulmcgregor.co.nz. And, also and spell spell McGregor something. for us. Ah, M C G R E G O R. All right, paulmcgregor.co.nz. And who who do you work with? Like, what uh, yeah, do I you work do you do you work internationally, just in New Zealand? Or? Uh, most of my work is in New Zealand, but I also work with clients in Australia, and I would love to work with more clients around the world. So feel free to get in touch. <laughs> yeah, it's easy to make it happen. All right, so you Zoom and, and yeah, yeah. Meet, yeah. Do, do virtual stuff as well. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. Well, I, um, I really appreciate the, the foundations of your work in community, in, in education, in, in these sort of humble spaces. Right. It's not like, you know, you haven't come out of NASA or, or some, you know, Silicon Valley unicorn with, you know, flashing credentials. You just like worked in humble places with people um, using kind of, I, I dare to say, ancient technologies of, mm. of being. Mm. And, you know, it, it feels like such water for a parched humanity. <laughs> so... So, you know, I think about my own life and how much better it would be served by more curiosity, intrigue, presence, questions. And as we've seen today, the skills that you've given me and the questions you've asked me that help help me to um, embody those hopefully more, more fully and more skillfully. So I, I really want to thank you for the work you do in the world and for taking the time today. Awesome. Thanks, Howie. It's been a whole lot of fun. Cheers. Take care.